another side to the nuclear discussion, and that's nuclear power. And the consequences that we saw uh, a few years ago at Fukushima. And so now we want to invite Chizu Hamada, who will speak on the links between nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and the ongoing dangers of Fukushima. You know, when things leave the news, we often don't think about them. And so this is an important reminder that things, we're still living with the consequences of what happened there. Um, Chizu is a San Francisco business owner and spokesperson for the No Nukes Action Committee, a group of Japanese citizens, Japanese Americans, and others who came together after the 311, 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and meltdowns at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Good morning. I was born in Tokyo, Japan three years after the United States of America um, de uh, detonated two atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, while I've called America my home for 40 years, I can never forgive this country for the inhumane act it committed in 1945. Simply put, Atomic bombings are international war crimes. But I am grateful to see you get, get uh, here. I believe your will and strength to abolish the nuclear weapons will change the world one day. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings are demonstration done on innocent human beings. The USA government need to show their might and power. And they succeeded. The rest of the world, uh, USA had the most powerful weapons in the history of man. But when I think of these bombings, I always think of victims and their sufferings. Picadon, that what victims called atomic bomb, pika to describe the intense light, dawn to describe the enormous explosion that followed. Pika don killed more than a more than 100,000 people instantly in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the next few months, uh, acute effect killed another 100,000 people and suffering of the survivors, Hibakusha, from uh, after effect of radiation, still continues to this day. There is no end to the suffering caused by atomic bomb. The USA has spent billions of dollars to develop these new uh, nuclear weapons and technology, and of course, they have looked for the way to recoup their investment. That's where nuclear power plants come in. The USA sold nuclear power plant to Japan and Japan regrettably bought them. Imagine that Japan, a country that suffered so much from atomic bomb, decided that nuclear power was a good choice. The American because the American government was cunning and sly, and Japanese government was stupid and vain. And the Japanese uh, government wanted to own the nuclear technology and the weapons. Since then, 54 nuclear power plants have sprouted like a mushroom on a earthquake from island, 54 plants. And three years and five months ago, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant melted down when a huge earthquake and tsunami struck Japan. Were we supposed to be surprised to rely on a technology with a history of calamity? What were we to expect? 
And today, the Fukushima accident is far from the over. The problems and the difficulties are only glowing. But despite of these troubles, Japanese government has never given up on the nuclear power plant. And they pushing forward on the nuclear recycling and reprocessing programs and then planning to restart many nuclear power plants. Despite the disapproval of the majority of the people, why can't the Japanese government give up the nuclear power plant? Because the nuclear power plant can produce plutonium. The nuclear power plants are passed to the nuclear weapons. In 1993, former Prime Minister Hata said, Japan has the capability to produce nuclear weapons. On July 1st this year, Japan approved a reinterpretation of peace constitution. The, this approval allows the use of self-defense force outside of Japan. Japan is stepping forward toward the militarism with the capacity to produce nuclear weapons. This is a terrifying thought and it must be stopped. Nuclear weapons and the nuclear power plant go hand in hand. It is foolish to think otherwise. The International Fission of the Prevention of Nuclear War stated a world without nuclear weapons will only be possible if we also phase out nuclear energy. If we want a world without nuclear weapons, then we must phase out nuclear energy. This is a fact we fight for. We fight for our children. We fight for the coming generations. I came from Tokyo, a long time resident of America, and I have decided to fight. I hope we will continue to fight together. Thank you. My name is Dr. Robert Gould. I've been president of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility for since 1989, and I've also been on the National Board of Physicians for Social Responsibility since 1993. I served as president of Physicians for Social Responsibility in 2003, and I'm currently national president again this year, 2014. And so you're where now and why? Well, we're in Livermore as we have been for year after year, which is distressing in terms of the fact that Livermore Lab has continued to play a central role in the development of nuclear weapons. And we in PSR, together with our international Nobel Prize winning organization, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, have continued to speak out uh, for health professionals about the need for the abolition of nuclear weapons. We as health professionals have long recognized since the founding uh, of our organization back in the early 1960s that is delusional to think that there can be any health response to nuclear weapons once they detonate because of the health uh, impacts due to heat, blast, and radiation which caused the deaths of over 210,000 human beings in Japan by the end of 1945 and continue to plague the world with the impacts of radiation in the form of a variety of chronic diseases, developmental problems, as well as cancer. Um, so these are the issues that are central to physicians and other health professionals working with PSR. We're, we also, given that our organization opposes nuclear power because we, we think that there's been amply demonstrated problems related to uh, storage of nuclear waste, safety in operations, 
uh, the fact that uh, it's always been a central issue for PSR that inevitably countries, and we've seen it by history, that many countries who have had nuclear power programs have a path to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. This is of particular concern to us most recently because of the U.S.-India nuclear deal whereby India, which is not a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty, is being provided by the U.S. Uh, support for high-level uh, technical nuclear programs that allow the Indian government to free up its resources to develop nuclear weapons while we're giving them the aid on nuclear power development. We're very concerned about the double standard that that shows, but probably more important and which is a central issue for PSR and IPPNW as well as our colleagues within ICANN, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, is the fact that even a small nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, not a full-fledged thermonuclear exchange between the U.S. and Russia, which of course, given the situation in the Ukraine, is still a danger for us, even a small exchange within regional powers can have global impacts. So there's been recent uh, research that's indicated that, a rel again, a relatively small number of weapons exchanged between India and Pakistan could, through the incineration of multiple cities on each side of the border, lead to so much soot and pollutants getting raised by the incineration of cities that it would block out the sunlight, leading to a plunge in global temperatures over the next 10 years. And by dint of that type of particulate matter, etc., blocking out sunlight lead to a fall in food production. So our latest estimates that such an exchange could likely lead to worldwide malnutrition with deaths from malnutrition anywhere from 1 billion to 2 billion, depending on how many weapons are exchanged. So we now, it's certainly not offering that as an antidote to global warming, to be incinerating that many nuclear weapons, but we certainly understand the gravity of the situation, particularly when our policies feed that type of proliferation. So we just think it's time to abolish nuclear weapons, and we're very pleased that there's now an international movement within ICANN that the majority of the world's governments are supporting this, but we have to move on our country and the rest of the nuclear weapon states to heed the voice of, of people around the world. We don't need, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars that are going to go into nuclear weapons programs where, and I could speak as a physician, we are not having enough money to provide people decent health care, we're not dealing with major public health problems, and we certainly aren't developed, have the resources to be able to deal with the real problems po posed by global warming. So it's time to get straight as a world community to get together, get rid of these weapons, and deal with the real problems that we have at, our, at hand. And yet there's a plan to develop uh, more, better nuclear weapons and delivery systems over the next couple of decades. How do you square that with the objective to abolish? Well, I think you've hit on the central contradiction, Jim. I mean, you know, we were pleased when President Obama in Prague announced that his support for a world without nuclear weapons, but we haven't seen that when we actually look at the programs of, as you're indicating, modernization programs within the Department of Energy, like here at Livermore, which are feeding the designs to make our weapons much more powerful and much more accurate. And our feeling is that, that that's craziness in the sense that actually would provide, uh, make these weapons, uh, quote unquote, more usable. And uh, this is a lot of the problems that we have about the real Orwellian language of Livermore and other folks within the Department of Energy to say they're building this for safety and reliability. We're talking about safety, we're talking about, you're talking about nuclear weapons that you could have accidents. Eric Schlosser's recent book, Command and Control, illustrate the safety problems that way, that, that's endemic in our nuclear stockpile. We're talking about reliability for these new weapons. We're talking about greater assuredness that we can kill people around the world uh, at a distance. So I just think that's folly and just another reason why we're here. Can you talk about the, um the health effects that we already are experiencing as a species from uh, the use and the production of the weapons so far? Well, there have been a number of examples of, of uh, accumulating evidence of, of the impacts of, of certainly uh, nuclear, the initial nuclear weapons impacts that were studied by the survivors of the Japanese detonations, the Hibakusha. 
and a series of, uh, of reports that have come out from the National Academy of Science with the, uh, on the biological effects of ionizing radiation have indicated progressively that there is no safe level of radiation because we know that all radiation is going to increase the number of mutations that could lead to cancer and can also have impacts on a population basis of a variety of diseases, autoimmune diseases, other chronic diseases as well. So, I mean, we live in a complex world where at the same time where we have these increasing radioactive hazards, such as the emissions from Fukushima, interact with a very polluted industrial base that we have worldwide in terms of chemicals that we produce, the 83,000 or so chemicals that are out there. So we're toying with the species in terms of these very deadly technologies and that we can already see in wildlife, for example, significant impacts on reproductive uh, outcomes and things like that. So this is a significant input into those those causes of disease that we certainly understand. So, you know, we, we certainly, and you know, the other thing I would add is that we can't just look at, you know, what are the impacts of a nuclear detonation or in a, you know, a release of radiation such as Fukushima. We have to look when we're, for example, looking at nuclear power, the whole life cycle of it and its broad impacts, not just on the individuals who might eat the tainted salmon, say from, from Fukushima, but everywhere along the line, from the people who like largely uh, First Nations, Navajos who are mining uranium, getting exposed to that, the communities that have the, the uranium tailings, all the way up to the over 600,000 workers in the Department of Energy sites and others who expose in the development of nuclear weapons, and the communities all around the world are completely at risk. People today spoke about the importance of the Marshall Islands suit. This is a, a community from the Pacific Islands who were basically toyed with in terms of giving up their islands so we could detonate them for nuclear testing and been left with the residue of radioactive contamination and a whole variety of other problems that result from their dislocation from their culture and their livelihood. And it's so important that the Marshall Islands have done us a service by initiating a suit against a nuclear weapon state to stop this, not for just, just their legacy issues, but for the rest of the world, that this is madness that should not be generalized in our experience. I get back to my grandchildren again, you know, do I want my grandchildren to grow up in a world like this? I'm glad they're here today, but all of us have to talk to our families about this. This is an issue that's so much about family values, if you're really thinking long term, and about, like, you know, what, where's our planet heading? My name is Wilson Riles and Pat and I will be uh, in seeing the beginning of this program. And we want to start with some words from someone who knows quite a bit about what's going on here at Livermore Labs. Um, I want to uh, bring him forward because he is doing what the mayor of Hiroshima asks us all to do. He is bringing forth the fact that Hiroshima asks everyone throughout the world to accept this wish of the Habakusha and walk with them the path to nuclear weapons abolition and world peace. And that is Scott Young. Scott will detail uh, weapons activities currently underway here at Livermore Labs. Scott is a staff attorney at Livermore based with Tri-Valley uh, Tri Cares. He manages the group's environmental and right to know litigation and is preparing an amicus brief in support of the Marshall Islands federal case, uh, Yunt facilitates a support group of Livermore Lab and other workers made ill uh, on the job uh, here at Livermore. Thank you, good morning, everybody. So good to see all your beautiful faces here. 
So as we gather today outside this fence on this somber memorial to stand in solidarity with thousands of other people in the world who are doing the same thing, to remember the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think we also are standing to remember other Habaksha, other victims of nuclear weapons and atomic weapons, including those in the Marshall Islands, downwinders of the Nevada test site and other test sites around the world, and the thousands of nuclear weapons workers, including some from right here who have been made ill by on-the-job exposure. For them, we say no more nukes and never again. But as we stand here to outside these gates, 5,000 people are showing up for work, driving by us. It's partly why we have it right on this corner, so they'll see us. And they're going in there, some of them to maintain these tools of mass destruction. Others are developing an entirely new generation of nuclear weapons. And every year, right behind this fence, they manage to spend a billion dollars on these pursuits. And this is just a portion of the overall funds that are devoted to this work in our country on these nuclear nightmares. The complex of which New Livermore Lab is a part of actually is spending $2 million every hour of every day on nuclear weapons. And if the weaponeers get their way, who are in control of this right now, by 2030 they'll be spending twice that much, $4 million an hour on nuclear weapons. And the plan is not just to refurbish the weapons in the stockpile, but we're also building a whole new generation of submarines to deliver those weapons, a whole new generation of bombers to deliver those weapons, and a whole new generation of intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver those weapons. Some of these things that we're building aren't going to even be ready for 20 years or more. And adjusted for inflation, we're spending more now than we did at the height of the Cold War on these weapons. And that's supposedly been over the Cold War for 23 years. So there's a saying, put your money where your mouth is. Well, according to our money, our country's mouth is saying, we commit our children and to another generation of excessive nuclear arsenals and the horrors they represent. And I mention money because people often ask me, why are we still, still developing these weapons of mass destruction? And while politics is part of it, I think we really need to follow the money. For example, Sandia National Lab, which has a California site right here next to Livermore Lab, uh, has a magazine. And you know, Sandia is, uh, is uh, managed by Lockheed Martin Corporation. And in their magazine, they recently touted how they sent their staff to Washington, D.C. to, quote, help decision makers prioritize a new weapon called the long-range nuclear cruise missile, long-range standoff nuclear cruise missile. And they're going to massively profit from this weapon if they build it, yet they're in Washington persuading our, our own leaders to help them do that. Livermore Lab will also do studies on this and heavily, heavily profit from it. So as executives and stockholders at Lockheed and Livermore's management consortium, which includes Bechtel, Babcock and Wilcox Corporation and Battelle Corporation, <clears throat> are profiting from this, we're all suffering. Uh, Livermore Lab is also continuing to request funding to do plutonium experiments in their biggest single program, the National Ignition Facility. So far we've spent $8 billion on that boondoggle and we've gotten very little to show for it. Um, but we're proud to say that thanks to the advocacy from Tri-Valley Cares this year in Washington, there is no funding going to plutonium experiments in the NIF. And I will say that our Senator, Dianne Feinstein, who we worked really hard w on that with, um, w was a stalwart on it and is making sure that hard questions get asked. But the impacts of this escalating investment into our nuclear weapons won't just be felt by the wallets of every American <clears throat> or the wallets of people in all the other countries that are modernizing to keep their stockpiles up with ours. The impacts will be felt in the form of more accidents, more spills, and more leaks at nuclear weapons facilities and the communities that house them. 
It'll also be felt by the environment that continues to be shortchanged in so many ways, including the cleanup of the very mess the development of these weapons has caused. The contaminated groundwater at Livermore currently is not scheduled to be totally cleaned up for 70 more years. It could really use more funding. We advocate for that, but they'd rather spend that money on weapons. Workers are also going to be impacted. I facilitate a support group for sick workers at Livermore Lab. Many of them have aggressive cancers, mysterious skin ailments, lung conditions like beryllium disease and asbestosis, all from working on these weapons. I have several clients actually who are now homeless because of the medical expenses that they've had to incur. Nationally, over 100,000 former workers have filed claims for compensation and benefits due to their illnesses. And 2,500 from Livermore and Sandia right here. And these people were told their jobs were safe. And they were often also told to cover up the accidents, spills, and exposures that they were receiving on the job. And this kind of secret atmosphere persists at the lab. And this week, something really interesting came to light. A Los Alamos employee who is a non-proliferation specialist named, named James Doyle was fired. And he was fired because he wrote a piece in an international journal called Why Eliminate Nuclear Weapons. That did not make the management at Los Alamos happy. Um, I'll, I can let you know it's a journal out of London. And I forget the name. Um, but his article talked about the myth of deterrence and the need for nuclear disarmament. And despite its basic reiteration of President Obama's own policies, uh, he believes that his sudden firing following the article was due to a National Nuclear Security Administration's headquarters-inspired campaign of retribution for his refusal to stay on message and support the lab's central mission, namely nuclear weapons development. And after he was fired, top lab and energy department officials responded to his case by urging that all writings by their employees on topics related to their work be subject to pre-publication review, even when written on their own time. This kind of censorship of our federal employees is not only dangerous, but in the immortal words of John Oliver, who spoke on his show last week about the dangers of enormous nuclear arsenals, it's weapons-grade bullshit. A couple of miles down the road in Livermore, every day in a small office, Mary Leah and I go to work to try to speak truth to the power wielded to, in this community from behind this fence and to increase the transparency of this super secret weapons lab. To organize the peaceful together, to show there is no consensus here in Livermore or anywhere for that matter for these weapons and to ensure that env the environment in this community is protected and is cleaned up to the highest standard of the law. It's an honor and a privilege to work for Tri-Valley Cares, and we're blessed with a venerable executive director, Mary Leah Kelly, who is on the committee that put this event together. So let's give her a quick hand. Let me now bring forward a very good friend of mine, someone who you all uh, probably know very well because she's known all over the world for fighting for nuclear abolition. That's Jackie Cabasso. She will, she will address um, the resurgent U.S. militarism in the Asia and Pacific and the growing dangers of the great power wars among uh, nuclear uh, armed nations. Jackie is the executive director of the Oakland-based Western States Legal Foundation since 1984 and as I said, is an internationally known leader fighting for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Jack. As my friend George Martin would say, good morning, family. Here we are at a fully functioning, obscenely well-funded United States government nuclear weapons research and development lab 69 years after the United States unleashed the nuclear age, dropping a single atomic bomb on Hiroshima, which indiscriminately incinerated tens of thousands of children, women, and men in an instant. A tiny and crude nuclear weapon by today's standards, justified by a lie of historic proportions that the bombing ended World War II and saved American lives. Over 90% of the doctors and nurses in Hiroshima were killed or injured by the bomb. It is also the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I, 
No one expected that war, but it is estimated that there were over 16 million deaths and 12 million wounded. The war to end all wars, brutal and barbaric as it was, took place before there were nuclear weapons, largely among combatants. Nearly 60% of the dead were military personnel. With conflicts raging around the world and the post-World War II order crumbling, we are now standing on the precipice of a new era of great power wars. The potential for wars among nations possessing nuclear weapons is growing. Nations which cling to nuclear weapons as central to their national security. In 2011, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton announced a major foreign policy shift, a long-term strategic pivot with diplomatic, economic, and military dimensions to Asia and the Pacific. The pivot is a plan to contain and encircle China, a rising U.S. competitor. The U.S. has been expanding its military alliances with many of China's neighbors, including Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Australia, is building new military bases, and has committed to deploy 60% of the Navy and Air Force to Asia and the Pacific. A new air-sea battle warfighting doctrine has been developed in the case of war against China. But nuclear-armed China is also a provocative actor, claiming sovereignty over 80% of the South China Sea, with seabeds believed to contain massive reserves of oil and natural gas. China and Japan are involved in a frightening standoff over the contested Senkaku Islands. President Obama, meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Abe this spring, said that these islands fall within the U.S.-Japan alliance and that the U.S. would back Japan if it came to war between Japan and China. China is challenging the Philippines over islands it claims and the United States is establishing a new military base there. In March of last year, U.S. B-52 bombers carried out simulated nuclear bombing raids on North Korea as part of ongoing U.S.-South Korean military exercises. And in December, as tensions over the Senkaku Islands rose, the U.S. provocatively flew a pair of unarmed B-52 bombers over airspace claimed by China as a demonstration of its commitment to defend Japan. These are just a few examples of a much larger, very complicated and dangerous trend. As the only nation so far to experience nuclear weapons in war, it is tragic that Japan, like other U.S. allies in the Asia-Pacific region, relies on the U.S. nuclear umbrella as the ultimate guarantor of its defense. Regrettably, since 1952, the U.S.-Japan military alliance has served a similar role in Asia that NATO has served in Europe, where its post-Cold War expansion has contributed to growing U.S.-Russian tensions. The U.S.-Japan alliance with more than 100 U.S. military bases across Japan, led former Prime Minister Koizumi to describe his nation as, quote, an unsinkable aircraft carrier for the United States, end quote. The U.S. is pushing hard to relocate Futenma Air Station from a heavily populated area of Okinawa to an offshore area in the smaller city of Nago. Anti-base sentiment runs deep in Okinawa, which hosts the bulk of U.S. military forces in Japan. Mayor Susumu Inami of Nago, a member of Mayors for Peace, has been heroically opposing the new base, citing dangers such as accidents, aircraft noise, and environmental damage, including threats to an endangered marine mammal called a dugong, similar to a manatee. Mayor Inamine visited Washington, D.C. in May to make his case to the U.S. State Department and rally international support. In Gangjong Village on Jeju Island in South Korea, where the Korean government, with U.S. support, is building a new naval base, a similar, better-known struggle is going on. There, too, the villagers were not consulted before construction began, and there are daily protests by locals, religious groups, and international human rights and environmental organizations. Mayor Kang, also a member of Mayor's for Peace, was arrested in 2011 for supposedly obstructing business at the construction site and detained for 90 days. Japan's turn to the right is another matter of great concern, with U.S. support for the recent decision of Prime Minister Abe's cabinet to change the interpretation of war renouncing Article 9 of the Constitution, a decision that substantially eviscerates the clause of its principles 
and steps away from some of the country's long-standing peace policies. The Global Council of the Abolition 2000 Global Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons has just issued a statement in solidarity with our Japanese colleagues and members calling on Japan not to abandon Article 9 of its peace constitution and to lead efforts for negotiations to eliminate nuclear weapons. With the U.S.-Russia conflict over the Ukraine and the U.S. strategic pivot to the Asia-Pacific, we have entered a new era of confrontation among nuclear armed powers and dangers of great power wars. Nuclear tensions in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and on the Korean Peninsula remind us that the threat of nuclear war is ever present. In a time of qu twin global economic and environmental crises and growing competition over natural resources, the dangers of conflicts among nuclear armed states are increasing. There is good reason to believe that the potential escalation of conflict among nuclear armed states leading to a nuclear war is much more likely than the potential use by a state of nuclear weapons which do not yet exist, or by subnational terrorist groups that do not yet have them. Yet this very real threat is largely dismissed. We can't afford to wait decades more for the elimination of nuclear weapons. The Mayor's for Peace 2020 vision is the right vision. In his August 6, 2014 peace declaration, yesterday in Hiroshima, Mayor Kazumi Matsui, the president of Mayor's for Peace, declared, each one of us will help determine the future of the human family. Please put yourself in the place of the Hibaksha. Imagine their experiences, including that day from the depths of hell, actually happening to you or someone in your family. To make sure the tragedies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki never happen a third time, let's all communicate, think, and act together with the Hibaksha for a peaceful world without nuclear weapons and without war. He goes on, we will do our best. Mayors for Peace, now with over 6,200 member cities, will work in conjunction with NGOs and the UN to disseminate the facts of the bombings and the message of Hiroshima. We will steadfastly promote the new movement stressing the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and seeking to outlaw them. We will help to strengthen international public demand for the start of negotiations on a nuclear weapons convention with the goal of the total elimination by 2020. It's our job to hold our government accountable for its failure to disarm. Good morning, everybody. So good to see all your beautiful faces here. So as we gather today outside this fence on this somber memorial to stand in solidarity with thousands of other people in the world who are doing the same thing, to remember the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I think we also are standing to remember other Habaksha, other victims of nuclear weapons and atomic weapons, including those in the Marshall Islands, downwinders of the Nevada test site and other test sites around the world, and the thousands of nuclear weapons workers, including some from right here, who have been made ill by on-the-job exposure. For them, we say no more nukes and never again. But as we stand here to outside these gates, 5,000 people are showing up for work, driving by us, partly why we have it right on this corner so they'll see us. And they're going in there, some of them to maintain these tools of mass destruction. Others are developing an entirely new generation of nuclear weapons. And every year, right behind this fence, they manage to spend a billion dollars on these pursuits. And this is just a portion of the overall funds that are devoted to this work in our country on these nuclear nightmares. The complex of which New Livermore Lab is a part of actually is spending $2 million every hour of every day on nuclear weapons. And if the weaponeers get their way, who are in control of this right now, by 2030 they'll be spending twice that much, $4 million an hour on nuclear weapons. 
And the plan is not just to refurbish the weapons in the stockpile, but we're also building a whole new generation of submarines to deliver those weapons, a whole new generation of bombers to deliver those weapons, and a whole new generation of intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver those weapons. Some of these things that we're building aren't going to even be ready for 20 years or more. And adjusted for inflation, we're spending more now than we did at the height of the Cold War on these weapons. Now we want to invite Chizu Hamada, who will speak on the links between nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and the ongoing dangers of Fukushima. Good morning. I was born in Tokyo, Japan, three years after the United States of America um, de uh, detonated two atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, while I've called America my home for 40 years, I can never forgive this country for the inhumane act it committed in 1945. Simply put, atomic bombings are international war crimes. But I am grateful to see you get together here. I believe your will and strength to abolish the nuclear weapons will change the world one day. The USA has spent billions of dollars to develop these new uh, nuclear weapons and technology, and of course, they have looked for the way to recoup their investment. That's where nuclear power plants come in. The USA sold nuclear power plants to Japan and Japan regrettably bought them. Imagine that Japan, a country that suffered so much from atomic bomb, decided that nuclear power was a good choice. The American because the American government was cunning and sly, and Japanese government was stupid and vain, and the Japanese government wanted to own the nuclear technology and the weapons. Since then, 54 nuclear power plants have sprouted like a mushroom on an earthquake from island. 54 plants and three years and five months ago Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant melted down when a huge earthquake and tsunami struck Japan. Were we supposed to be surprised? that a nuclear weapon is about to fall. And think of the person whose name you're wearing. Jackie Cabasso and I will soon sound the second siren to commemorate this time both Hiroshima and the bomb that fell on August 9th on Nagasaki. Those who wish may lie down and we will chalk your body around the outline to commemorate those who were vaporized and what's left, which you can see in the museums in Japan, is the smudge or the shadow. At some point, the police officers will come out and ask people to disperse. If you do not wish to risk arrest, when you're asked to disperse, please get up, leave your shadow, which is a powerful statement in and of itself. We are all here with the principles of nonviolence today, 
Um, and one of them is don't run, it can cause panic. So with that, Jackie and I will sound the siren. As we've heard, the theme this morning is failure to disarm. And I don't think I need to tell those of you who live around here about a failure to disarm. And I certainly don't have to tell the people of the Marshall Islands about a failure to disarm. They endured 67 nuclear weapon tests by the US from 1946 to 1958. They continue to suffer health and environmental consequences that really are, are beyond my imagination. The leaders of the Marshall Islands want to make sure that no one ever again suffers from the use of a nuclear weapon, whether it's on purpose, whether it's through testing or through the accidental use. That's why on April 24th of this year, just three months ago, the Marshall Islands filed the nuclear zero lawsuits for failure to disarm. <coughs> the, uh, <laughs> the Marshall Islands filed one lawsuit in US federal district court against the United States. And they also filed nine lawsuits in the International Court of Justice, one for each of the nine nuclear armed nations in the world. The lawsuits allege breach of Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and of customary international law. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6 calls for good faith negotiations for an uh, end to the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament. This treaty entered into force 44 years ago, 44 and a half years ago. Uh, that's not an early date. So uh, right there, we have a violation. Uh, right here, we have a violation, the continuation of the nuclear arms race. These lawsuits are unprecedented. <clears throat> they seek to force the nuclear armed nations to answer in a public, on the record way about how their actions, modernizing nuclear arsenals, planning for nuclear deployments many decades into the future, boycotting multilateral disarmament initiatives, square with their legal obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and under customary international law. So I want to talk about a few things that you can do to support the Marshall Islands. Uh, this is not just something that needs to play out in court and, and we sit back and, and hope that, that the lawyers and, and the courts do their jobs. Uh, this is something that we can all get involved in. And the first thing is to sign a petition and this petition is, uh, it has two purposes. One is a more immediate purpose, and that is to support the people and the leaders of the Marshall Islands, uh, to, to give them moral support, that we stand behind them for their courageous action. And you can do that online at the website nuclearzero.org. For those of you who use social media, you can check out the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation uh, on Facebook and on Twitter. We're always posting the latest updates about the case, uh, as are a number of our colleague organizations around the world, including some of them here today. Encourage groups, uh, civic groups, religious groups that you're involved in to sign on in support of the lawsuits. And most importantly, I think, uh, is to get involved with the local groups that are represented here today. Uh, there is nothing more important than working in your own community to make a better world. Deputy, uh, Deputy Cassell of the Alameda County Sheriff's Office, you are in violation of California Penal Code Section 647C, trespassing. On behalf of the state of California, I demand that you leave immediately. If you fail to do so, you will be arrested. As my friend George Martin would say, good morning, family. Here we are at a fully functioning, obscenely well-funded United States government nuclear weapons research and development lab, 69 years after the United States unleashed the nuclear age, dropping a single atomic bomb on Hiroshima, which indiscriminately incinerated tens of thousands of children, women, and men in an instant. A tiny and crude nuclear weapon by today's standards, justified by a lie of historic proportions that the bombing ended World War II and saved American lives. 
With the U.S.-Russia conflict over the Ukraine and the U.S. strategic pivot to the Asia-Pacific, we have entered a new era of confrontation among nuclear armed powers and dangers of great power wars. Nuclear tensions in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and on the Korean Peninsula remind us that the threat of nuclear war is ever-present. In a time of qu twin global economic and environmental crises and growing competition over natural resources, the dangers of conflicts among nuclear armed states are increasing. We can't afford to wait decades more for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Woo! The Mayor's for Peace 2020 vision is the right vision. In his August 6, 2014 peace declaration yesterday in Hiroshima, Mayor Kazumi Matsui, the President of Mayor's for Peace, declared, each one of us will help determine the future of the human family. Please put yourself in the place of the Hibaksha. Imagine their experiences, including that day from the depths of hell, actually happening to you or someone in your family. We will steadfastly promote the new movement stressing the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and seeking to outlaw them. We will help to strengthen international public demand for the start of negotiations on a nuclear weapons convention with the goal of the total elimination by 2020. It's our job to hold our government accountable for its failure to disarm. Thank you. People today spoke about the importance of the Marshall Island suit. This is a, a community from the Pacific Islands who were basically toyed with in terms of giving up their island so we could detonate them for nuclear testing and then left with the residue of radioactive contamination and a whole variety of other problems that result from their dislocation from their culture and their livelihood. And it's so important that the Marshall Islands have done us a service by initiating a suit against a nuclear weapon state to stop this, not for just, just their legacy issues, but for the rest of the world, that this is madness that should not be generalized in our experience. I get back to my grandchildren again, you know, do I want my grandchildren to grow up in a world like this? I'm glad they're here today, but all of us have to talk to our families about this. This is an issue that's so much about family values, if you're really thinking long term, and about, like, you know, what, where's our planet heading? He's the director of programs for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. He's worked on nuclear policy with the UK campaign for nuclear disarmament before moving to Santa Barbara in 2007 to join the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. He works closely with the government of the Republic of the Marshall Islands to coordinate the educational, policy, and legal components of the litigation. His work reminds us that we're all connected, that what's happening here in Livermore is connected to Japan, is connected to the Marshall Islands. And so we want to welcome Rick. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the welcome. Uh, as we've heard, the theme this morning is failure to disarm. And I don't think I need to tell those of you who live around here about a failure to disarm. Uh, as Scott said earlier this morning, the U.S. government continues to spend billions of dollars annually on nuclear weapon programs and very little on environmental cleanup. That's what we need here. I don't have to tell those, who, those of us who live around the U.S. about a failure to disarm. The U.S. government is spending more now on nuclear weapons than they did at the height of the Cold War. As we all know and as we've all experienced, uh, at the same time we're cutting health, education, infrastructure, many important human needs are going unmet because we're pursuing things such as uh, weapons of mass destruction. I don't have to tell those around the world about a failure to disarm. Uh, we all know it because we live under the constant threat of nuclear weapons, not only through the direct use of nuclear weapons, but also through indirect effects such as nuclear famine that can be caused by as few as a hundred nuclear weapons being used against cities. 
and I certainly don't have to tell the people of the Marshall Islands about a failure to disarm. They endured 67 nuclear weapon tests by the U.S. from 1946 to 1958. They continue to suffer health and environmental consequences that really are, are beyond my imagination. The leaders of the Marshall Islands want to make sure that no one ever again suffers from the use of a nuclear weapon, whether it's on purpose, whether it's through testing or through the accidental use. That's why on April 24th of this year, just three months ago, the Marshall Islands filed the nuclear zero lawsuits for failure to disarm. The, uh, the Marshall Islands filed one lawsuit in U.S. Federal District Court against the United States, and they also filed nine lawsuits in the International Court of Justice, one for each of the nine nuclear armed nations in the world. The lawsuits allege breach of Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and of customary international law. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6, calls for good faith negotiations for an uh, end to the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament. This treaty entered into force 44 years ago, 44 and a half years ago. Uh, that's not an early date. So uh, right there, we have a violation. Uh, right here, we have a violation, the continuation of the nuclear arms race. These lawsuits are unprecedented. <clears throat> they seek to force the nuclear armed nations to answer in a public, on the record way about how their actions, modernizing nuclear arsenals, planning for nuclear deployments many decades into the future, boycotting multilateral disarmament initiatives, square with their legal obligations under the Non Proliferation Treaty and under customary international law. So I want to stress, with these lawsuits, it's not just the U.S. that is being targeted by the Marshall Islands. Uh, they believe that all nine nuclear armed nations are guilty of a failure to disarm. Uh, and really not just those nine, but also their enablers around the world. Some of those enablers are other countries in NATO, uh, countries that live under the nuclear umbrella. But uh, also, as, as we heard from Scott earlier, the uh, corporations and the lobbyists who are making money out of this and uh, seek to perpetuate the nuclear arms race for their own profit. Another thing I want to stress, the Marshall Islands is doing this as a friend to the U.S. They're not trying to be antagonistic. Uh, it, the, uh, the way that, that uh, the Marshall Islands Foreign Minister Tony De Bruyne explains this is if you have a, a good friend and uh, that friend is uh, having a night out at the bar and wants to drive home, you don't let that friend do it. That behavior is damaging, it's dangerous to themselves, it's dangerous to others, and uh, could harm an unknown number of people. That's the same thing here with these lawsuits. Uh, the, it, it's not only endangering the world through the threat of uh, a nuclear weapons use, but it's also uh, threatening us here in the U.S. And, uh, and those in the other nuclear armed nations. So you'll hear a counter argument from maybe some of the policy people behind these gates, uh, definitely from people in the State Department, that we are disarming. We've gotten rid of 85 percent of the number of nuclear weapons that we had during the height of the Cold War. But the important thing to remember is that a nuclear arms race does not have to just be a qualitative thing. It's not just about numbers. A nuclear arms race, I'm oh, sorry, it doesn't have to be quantitative. Uh, it can also be qua qualitative. And that's what we have today with uh, the extension of uh, the lifetimes of some of these weapons, uh, improved military characteristics. Uh, this is unacceptable and it's absolutely a form of arms racing. <coughs> So I want to uh, explain just for a minute the current status of the lawsuits. Uh, in the International Court of Justice, things are moving along, but as a slow, at a slow pace, and that's kind of expected. Uh, we, 
we knew all along that that the ICJ is a a very lengthy thing. It's it's not going to be decided uh, in the next couple of months. We're looking at probably a year or two until there's any real meaningful action. But what is moving quickly is the case here in the U.S. in federal district court. Uh, about two weeks ago, the U.S. filed a motion to dismiss. Uh, they believe that uh, the lawsuit has no, no basis and, and should be thrown out of court. And they said as much in this uh, document that they filed. <clears throat> they call the lawsuit a manufactured claim. They state that the relief that is sought from the court would be contrary to the public interest. So just so you know, it, apparently it's in your interest uh, that, that we maintain nuclear weapons. Um, the, the Marshall Islands response is due on August 21st, so the legal team is hard at work crafting a 15-page response to the motion to dismiss and uh, putting to rest some of the things that the U.S. government has claimed. Uh, there's also a hearing scheduled at the federal court in Oakland on September 12th. So we're hopeful that uh, that hearing will indeed take place and uh, that that the U.S. will um, have to sit in court and uh, explain its positions in person. So to close, I want to talk about a few things that you can do to support the Marshall Islands. Uh, this is not just something that needs to play out in court and, and we sit back and, and hope that, that the lawyers and, and the courts do their jobs. Uh, this is something that we can all get involved in. And the first thing is to sign a petition. And this petition is, uh, it has two purposes. One is a more immediate purpose, and that is to support the people and the leaders of the Marshall Islands, uh, to, to give them moral support, that we stand behind them for their courageous action. And you can do that online at the website nuclearzero.org. Uh, you can also find me this morning, and I have some paper copies if you prefer to sign that way. For those of you who use social media, you can check out the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation uh, on Facebook and on Twitter. We're always posting the latest updates about the case, uh, as are a number of our colleague organizations around the world, including some of them here today. Another important one, and, and I know that, that those of you in the Bay Area are, are really good at this, probably better than, than uh, any other region that I know of, writing letters to the editor. Uh, this, is, this is hugely important. Uh, as many of you know, it's, it's pretty much the, the most widely read section of any newspaper. It's always the one that I go to first. And uh, it's a really great way to get your point across. So if you read a story in, in any newspaper, whether it's a local story, uh, whether it's in a national paper or an international paper, take a few minutes to write a letter and talk about, the, talk about the lawsuits, talk about the need to disarm, talk about the failure to disarm, and how you believe our government should be held accountable. Uh, encourage groups, uh, civic groups, religious groups that you're involved in to sign on in support of the lawsuits. And most importantly, I think, uh, is to get involved with the local groups that are represented here today. Uh, there is nothing more important than working in your own community to make a better world. And thank you for all that, that you all do uh, just for being here this morning and for all the work for peace uh, that you do throughout your lives. Thank you all. Woo!